Okay. Seems like most people have entered. Before we begin, I would like to have a word of prayer. So please bow your heads as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the knowledge you have left us, the information that you have provided for our good. And as we continue learning more, I pray that you will give us clear minds and you will give the speaker clear words that we may understand your will for us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good, yeah, I enjoyed it myself, praise the Lord. And um, I am excited to share with you this message. This is not the only thing on, I, I don't want you to think, we're talking about in part depression today on this message. This is not the only message. There's other things that are in addition to this, other lifestyle factors that can help enhance your happiness and help reverse depression. This is just one factor. I'm going to have another key component of it in the four o'clock session that literally could be the hinging point on the things in this message if they don't work the hinge point could be made in the in the in the message this afternoon and i'm excited to dive into the gut brain connection here and to begin with i want to talk about daniel and the gut brain connection um we'll see if the clicker works now Yes. Did I do that or did you do it? Okay. All right. All right. So, okay. Sounds good. All right. I'll, I'll, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll do this. Okay. Okay. So I want to begin by talking about Daniel and the gut brain connection. And this right here is a, this is research talking about looking back through history. So you can click forward here on looking at the, the history of inquiry into science. So medical professionals have actually sought to find out what is the oldest scientific study in all of recorded history. Um, can I have you up by the computer again? Um, what is the oldest study in all of recorded history? And this tells us right here that is 562 B.C., it says the world's first clinical trial is recorded in the book of Daniel in the Bible. This is what medical historians have been able to discover. Is that not fascinating in and of itself? If that was the only part, you would say that was a good message this afternoon. Now we can leave, right? <laughs> Just to know that the oldest scientific study in all of recorded history comes from the book of Daniel. Now, the study comes from Daniel chapter 1. You probably know about it. Daniel's taken captive from his hometown of Jerusalem, taken to Babylonia, put through a three, in, in Babylon, taken through a three-year educational system. In that, he was given the best food the king could muster. And what would the best food generally be? Meat, right? Meat-based diet. Everybody knows that's the nothing like animal protein for good health and happiness, right? Well, research might show us a little bit differently today. And so what do we see here? Daniel and his friends didn't want to eat the king's food. And so they decided, you know, that maybe there's things in here that go against God's word. And so we read in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not what? defile himself. So they decided, okay, uh, let's not do this. And then we notice here in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 12, Daniel chapter 1 verse 12 says, prove your servants, if you could click forward there, 
prove your servants, I beg of you, I plead with you, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, what is pulse? It's things that are grown from seeds. So Daniel and his friends go on a a 10-day diet initially of plant-based foods, standard Babylonian diet is a meat-based diet. And what ends up happening at the end, we see here in Daniel chapter 1, 18 to 20, it says, now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, uh, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So notice the biggest impact to Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, was that they had an enhancement in their cognition. Their diet actually enhanced their mental health. And I'm going to show you a video clip here from the documentary that my wife and I produced on health called Ancient Health. And it's just a few minutes long. It's, it's an hour and a half documentary. But we're going to look just at a, a few minutes of this on how can it impact the mental health of people today. So this is quite fascinating. We'll watch this. Should be concerned about is how long you live and how likely are you to get disease? And there have been three major studies published on this subject, big meta-analyses. And these meta-analyses, and only three big ones have been published, they show consistently that low-carb diets, in other words, low plant food diets, high animal food diets, consistently they show that they're associated with more heart disease and more death, more mortality. If you look around the world and you look at these people in the blue zones, the, the average percentage of calories from carbs range from, ranges from about 50% to about 80%. It, carbs are not the enemy, refined carbs are the enemy. Uh, there have been a number of recent studies. Uh, Dr. Beeshold uh, out of Phoenix, Arizona, first she did an observational study showing that plant-based diet actually significantly improves your depression and anxiety stress score. It's called a DASS score. So the mood actually is improved when you get the right amount of carbohydrates, but also the right type of carbohydrates and less protein. Then she followed up with an interventional study and that's where she took people who are not on a plant-based diet and put them on a plant-based diet for two weeks. She also put them on a plant-based diet plus fish for two weeks to see which one would be superior. And it turned out the fish diet wasn't any more superior than the carnivore diet. But the plant-based diet, significant dramatic changes, statistically significant changes in just two weeks in their mental ability. We see when people go on this diet and drink plenty of water, get plenty of rest, follow these natural remedies that they, it's just like something snaps in their brain and it doesn't take like weeks or months. Plant-based diet is key in our program for depression and anxiety recovery. The results are outstanding because it's a comprehensive approach, it's not just diet. We also utilize exercise and we're utilizing correct thoughts and a lot of different modalities. But the diet is a key element. I went on a plant-based diet about five weeks ago. It's amazing because I, even if they had, had not told me he had the diet change, the first thing I noticed was he was bringing his schoolwork in. And my teacher has actually been bragging on how much better I've been behaving since I've been on the diet. In class, he wasn't getting as distracted, that he was paying attention, he was able to listen more closely. He was being alert, his discernment was better. Uh, he was more diligent, everything. I can pay attention more. My mind is more clear since I've been on the diet. It's just a, a huge improvement. And I also noticed he lost a lot of weight. I mean, but the main things I noticed was behavioral. A study in a middle school has showed clearly that switching the menu from animal source to plant source diet almost eliminated absenteeism. Um, increased and in, enhanced attention and homework performance and performance at school. It, it almost eliminated acts of violence 
as well as teen pregnancies. And so they just feel better everywhere the blood flows, everywhere that perfect circulation goes, they feel better, not just in body, but in mind, clears up their thoughts even. And every single day since I've been on a plant-based diet, the clarity continues to increase and my face continues to look younger and I, my body feels like I feel like I look more vibrant. I, I've looked at pictures of myself before and after and I look five years older, even just 10 months ago, than I do now. What we eat does get turned into neurotransmitters. It actually helps us or hurts us depending on what we're eating in regards to our brain chemistry and it plays a vital role in health of the brain. They'll say within three or four days, they, they seem to have clarity, they can, they're, they're alert, they, they, can, they listen in class better, they absorb more, and they do better on their tests. The fog has been lifted out of my head, I think clear, I've got better ideas, I believe. Um, I, can, I can put two and two together faster, and just in general, I'm happy. In fact, diet alone, studies show that diet alone will reduce your depression and anxiety scores by half just by dramatically changing your diet to a plant-based. And so that's significant. Now we go for more than just half, and so that's why we have a whole program that, in, that includes more than this. Uh, but just the diet alone will make a big difference. You don't have to choose between high quality living and longevity. It's the same program. The same new start approach to living helps you live longer and it helps you live better. Am I on? Thank you. So, um, isn't that interesting, right? That a study from 2,500 years ago, done in a school, right? Daniel and his friends were in school, Babylonian school. A study done then, replicated today, has the same results. Isn't that powerful? That's true science. Because true science can be replicated and have the true results, right? And so you see that even today, kids who are put on this type of diet change, right? They, they do better, they feel better, they perform better. Um, just you can't beat on God's methods, right? And so it's just so powerful that um, this, is, this is how science today is showing that God's word can be trusted. Amen. And, and all from the gut-brain connection, right? Do you see that? What goes on in the gut affects the brain, affects the emotions. So that's, that's powerful. So uh, another Bible text that talks about um, the brain is in Lamentations 1 verse 20. And it says, Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress, my bowels are troubled. Now we look at that and we think that's kind of funny, right? You're like, oh, okay. But I really think they had a real close connection with their bodies and they understood when one was affected, the other one was affected as well. And uh, we see here uh, this diagram talking about the gut brain again, that approximately, Chad said it last night, approximately 90% of the information is traveling from the gut to the brain and not the other way around. So that means your gut has a, a great influence on your brain, that it's sending all this information to the brain. It says here on Councils on Diets and Foods, page 50, it says, the abuses of the stomach by the gratification of appetite are a fruitful source of what? Most church trials. Now you would look at this and you're thinking, are you serious? Come on, we have worse problems than this. But with the studies that are coming out today, with the science that's coming out today, you realize that this is really true. Science is showing that quotes like this are really true, that what's going on in our guts is causing our issues between each other. And in the past, I would have looked at something like this and thought, man, um, 
I don't know about this, you know, or, or I'd look at something like that and think, you, you know, you feel condemned or something, but actually I look at it like, oh, wow, God understands my body. When I'm frustrated and, and troubled and not doing well, could it be something's going on in my gut that's making my behavior like this? Instead of beating myself up and beating myself up and saying, oh, it's just you, you don't have enough faith, you're not trusting God, da 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 da, da and you beat yourself up. And instead, God is saying, no, no, I, I know how your body works. If you would just do this, you'd have a peaceful life. Isn't that good news? It's such a different way of looking at it, right? Instead of, oh, no, not that, you know. Anyway, so this has been encouraging to me because I didn't grow up being in a, in a quiet atmosphere, <laughs> right? I didn't grow up um, in a peaceful atmosphere. But scientists have discovered that a high-fat diet leads to depressive, anxious symptoms in mice. And it also promotes inflammation. And so what they did is they put, um, they put mice on a high-fat diet, and then they put other mice on uh, a regular fat diet, okay? And what they found is the mice that were on the regular fat diet they, I mean, on the high-fat diet, sorry, they exhibited things like anxiety and um, impaired memory and repetitive behaviors and inflammation. So the mice that had high fat, these are the things that they had, anxiety, impaired memory, repetitive behaviors, and inflammation. And interesting, when you're depressed, you have inflammation in the body and you have repetitive behaviors. You go over the same thing over and over and over, right? You just think about the same thing and it, it gets to you. And so what they found is the regular fat diet mice did not exhibit these same behaviors. Isn't that interesting? Until they took the microbes from the guts of the high fat diet mice and they transplanted them into the guts of the regular fat diet mice. And guess what the regular fat diet mice then started to do? The same behaviors. They had anxiety, impaired memory, repetitive behaviors, and inflammation. So the high fat diet somehow affects the gut bacteria, right? It affects the gut bacteria and causes the bad bacteria to increase. Because remember, what is fat or, or a high fat diet, it's a refined food, right? Chad talked about that earlier. It's something that the fiber has been removed and you're, you're left with the concentrated thing, right? The oils. And so the body doesn't do well with these things. And here it says in child guidance, page nine, I mean, 398, it says, Eating too frequently, too much, and of rich, unwholesome food destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the brain, and perverts the judgment, preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. So again, you see here the gut-brain connection, that if we're eating too frequently, right, not giving the gut a chance to relax, if we're eating too much, and then that overworks it as well, and rich, unwholesome food. So rich foods would be like high fat, high sugars, high this, high that, and then unwholesome would be refined, you know, the packaged foods. So it actually affects our digestive uh, system. And then also in Child Guidance, page 460, it says, and this is really encouraging to me, and I'll tell you why. It says, it cannot be too often repeated that whatever is taken into the stomach affects not only the body, but ultimately the mind as well. It is difficult and often well nigh what? Impossible for one who is intemperate in diet to exercise what? Patience and self-control. Has that ever been you? I know it's been me, right? Right? You're so impatient, and you get out of control, and you're angry, and this and that and the other, and then you beat yourself up, and you're like, I am such a faithless person. Why don't I love Jesus more? And you beat yourself up, and then you look at something like this, and you're like, it's difficult and often well-nigh impossible. 
if I'm being intemperate in how I eat, to control myself. Did you know that this is actually a biblical principle? Look at this next um, text. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it says, this is the stepping stone of faith, right? And you're building. Add to your faith what? Virtue and to virtue, knowledge and to knowledge, temperance. What comes after temperance? Patience. This is a biblical principle. God says, you cannot be patient if you are not exercising temperance. Isn't that good news? I think it's really good news for those of us that are angry by nature, you know, like we just deal with these things. To me, this is good news. I don't look at it like, oh, God, another thing you're piling on my back, you know. I don't look at it like that at all. I look at it like, this is freeing. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to sit and cry at night on my pillow and, and like, wonder why on earth I act the way I do. This is good news. God has given us a decision to make of being temperate. If I go to bed late at night, am I going to be nice the next morning to my husband? Not, not usually. Uh, if, I, if I eat something that I know doesn't agree with me, do you think I'm going to be really sweet to my kids? No, I don't think so. So you understand how this works, right? And so we're seeing here this next slide. This, this is how the gut-brain connection works. It has a real impact on us, and that's why it's so important. We're not up here beating anybody up. We're just telling you our experience, our testimony, and how the Lord opened our eyes to this, and that it's been a blessing, a major blessing. It doesn't mean we've arrived. It doesn't mean that we've figured everything out, but it just means that God has blessed us with something to go forward with. Um, the slide before, I was just going to share one thing in um, where, where it had, yeah. So just a quick, quick little digestive um, understanding. We, we have fiber, and fiber, when it's in the body, the gut bacteria helps to digest the fiber, okay? And guess what you get as a byproduct from that gut bacteria digesting your fiber. Short-chain fatty acids, okay? And guess what short-chain fatty acids do for you? They lower inflammation. Isn't that powerful? And inflammation is a marker of depression and other lifestyle diseases. And so if you feed your gut the fiber or the gut bacteria, if you give them plenty of fiber, they will give you plenty of happiness, right? Because those short-chain fatty acids decrease the inflammation, and inflammation is something that we all have to fight with all the time, right? So God has given us fiber, and what is fiber? Fiber is eating the, the fruit, the veggies, all that in their whole form, not extracting the oil from the olive, but eating the olive, right? Not extracting the sugar from the fruit, but eating the fruit, God packaged these things in this way. And so, um, like we saw before, the high fat caused inflammation and problems for the mice, right? So the high fat causes problems for the gut bacteria, but the high fiber, the gut bacteria loves. Are you guys getting this? The two opposites? And so the next time somebody asks you when you're on a, plant, a whole food plant-based diet, when they ask you, where do you get your protein from, right? Have you ever been asked that, right? You can ask them, where do you get your fiber from, right? Because fiber causes a lot of problems. Or lack of fiber, sorry. Lack of fiber causes a lot of problems. But how many people have you ever met that have died from a lack of protein? People starving to death. That's who has a lack of protein, people starving to death. We do not have a lack of protein in the U.S., okay? We are far from that, but we do have a lack of fiber problem in the U.S. And the gut bacteria will bless you for eating more of it. Let's continue. It says here in Scientific American, think twice how the guts, what are they calling our gut? 
The second brain, isn't that neat? Uh, how it influences your mood and well-being. And it says here, the second brain informs our state of mind in other more obscure ways. If we go forward, um, thank you. The second brain informs our state of mind in other more obscure ways as well. A big part of our emotions are probably influenced by the nerves in our gut. And we'll skip down. Although GI turmoil can sour one's moods, everyday emotional well-being may rely on the messages from the brain below to the brain above. So depending on how your stomach's doing, it can sour your mood, you know? And, and uh, let's look at this next statement here in Councils on Diet and Foods. It says, people who have a sour stomach are very often of a sour disposition. Everything seems to be contrary to them, and they are inclined to be peevish and irritable. If we would have peace amongst ourselves, we should give more thought than we do to having a peaceful stomach. Isn't that nice? So uh, the word peevish, it means being like easily irritated by things that are not important. <laughs> Isn't that a funny uh, definition? But it is true, you know, like there's, there's times where if we're not doing well, uh, we get irritated over the smallest thing. And then when our guts are doing well, then we laugh at that same thing. We're like, how ridiculous is that? You know, it makes a difference. Uh, did you know that two-thirds of your immune system is found in your gut? So that also is very important to our well-being, right? If two-thirds of your immunity is found in your gut, that's got to tell us, like, wow, the gut is really important, right? If you want to fight disease, if you want to ward off the things that are hitting this planet, right, you need to make sure that your gut is healthy, not just for your mental well-being, but your physical well-being. This next slide says the surprising link between gut germs and toddler's tantrums. Oh, isn't that interesting? So what they found in this study is that uh, children who were uh, social and outgoing and friendly had a greater diversity of good gut bacteria. And children who um, were, were antisocial and afraid and had tantrums had less diversity of good gut bacteria. Isn't that interesting? And so after we figured this out, Chad and I now have this thing like, you know, we're always meeting new people and stuff. And so a little three-year-old will come up to us and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. And then we'll be like, wow, that kid's got good gut bacteria because <laughs> he's not afraid of us, you know, super outgoing. And, and it's funny, but then you'll find the opposite is true too. Like a parent will open up and say, my kid went through this, 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 got some gut issues. And then you see the behavior of the child, you know, and a lot of times it could be some kind of an allergy the child is going through. You don't know. And yet you think my child is just messed up, but it could be what you're feeding them could be affecting them. And if you just find out what it is, they'll be happier for it, right? Um, it's not for today, but there's, there's plenty of information out there about helping kids figure out their allergies so you can figure out how to help them with their behavioral issues. So if you want a good ratio between, um, or a good ratio of good bacteria in your gut, what should you do? Right? That's the question. What should you do? Well, guess what? Chad's going to come up and answer that for us. This, this next slide is from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which was headed out by Dr. Neil Barnard, who's done scientific research with the United States government and on specifically diabetes. And we notice here what this article says is, it says, the title of it is, Vegan Diets Lead to Healthier Intestinal Bacteria. Now, the question is, why? Now, I want to be very clear. You, there is a difference between, there are many vegans. Vegans are typically vegan for one of two reasons. What are the two reasons that people might choose to become a vegan? Health, and what's the other one? 
animal cruelty. Those are the two main reasons. And somebody, you know, which, or the environment, that might be a third one, but the animal cruelty and environment might kind of, loop, kind of stick together because sometimes people do that and you could eat, did you know that Oreo cookies are vegan? Did you know that beer is vegan? Did you know that whiskey is vegan? So you could eat refined junk food and be a vegan. Is that healthy, yes or no? No. No. And sometimes people who do it for animal rights, they're not doing it for health, and so they become unhealthy, and they skew the studies. Does that make sense? Because they get looped in together. And, uh, but the distinction is there's one massive study uh, on Seventh-day Adventists specifically because many of them happen to be vegan. And so that actually is different because they're actually the main goal amongst them is actually to be healthy. So when they look at them, they actually find different results than they do in many of the other studies. It's because these people are seeking health. And as they eat a whole food, plant-based diet, they do much better. But why is it that a vegan diet leads to healthier intestinal bacteria? One of the reasons is because, Fadi already mentioned it, what is found in plant food? Fiber and bacteria, actually. Two things that are promoting good health in your gut because they promote good bacteria in the gut. So looking at, let's say, an apple. Research has found that an apple has about 100 million different bacteria on or in that apple. And so you might be thinking, then I will never eat an apple again. Well, actually, no, it turns out that this bacteria in general is actually beneficial for you. And so there's a diversity of bacteria on that or in that apple. But if you only eat apples, you only get the diversity from the type of apple that you're eating. But then if you add to your diet pears, you get a whole nother microbial diversity on the pear. And so you're adding to the microbiome of your gut. And then if you add to your diet plums and peaches and kale and spinach and carrots, and you add, it doesn't have to be all at the same meal, but you're adding these things to your diet. You're adding to the pool of bacteria And therefore, giving yourself a healthier gut, which is actually going to give you a better mind as a result of it. Does this make sense? It makes perfect sense. Plus, you're getting the fiber. And guess what? How much fiber do you find in animal foods? Zero. There is no fiber in the animal kingdom. Fiber is a part of the structure of plants. That's where where we actually get the fiber. And this fits with Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Where the word of God says, what did he say that he gave to Adam and Eve in the beginning? He said, you, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the, which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for what food, right? So God says, I gave you plants. This is what we see in Genesis given to Adam and Eve. Now, did you know what the word Eden means in the Hebrew language? The word Eden means pleasure. So this is the garden of pleasure. So you would expect that whatever God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden of pleasure would be best suited for giving you pleasure or health and happiness. Do you follow? And that's exactly what we see looking at the research here. So this right here is taken from the Bulgarian Journal of Plant Physiology. Do you have that sitting on your coffee table at your house? Uh, Probably not, but in the Bulgarian Journal of Plant Physiology, the title of this article is Animal Neurotransmitter Substances Are Found in Plants. What does this mean? So we have in our brain something called neurotransmitters, or we we could make it simple and call them brain chemicals. And research actually shows that the chemicals that we need for a healthy mind are found where? in plants. So if we're not eating a diversity of plants, may we not be getting a diversity of the chemicals that our brains need to be happy. Notice this article here. This is taken from the University of Queensland in Australia. The title of this is, Fruit is a Depression Buster for who? For women. What does this mean? The research actually shows that the more fruit that women consume, the less depression they have. More fruit, happier right? Very simple. And this next study here, we notice here from the Journal of Neuropsychiatry of Clinical Neuroscience, and the title for this 
is called depression and fruit treatment. It's kind of small, but I'll read some of it to you. It says, depression is a common mood disorder affecting sleep, appetite, and libido. And is also one of the manifestations of dementia and may lead to suicide attempts, particularly with violent methods. Research has shown the involvement of serotonin, melatonin, and tryptophan for depression. Those are these neurochemicals that they talk about, these neurotransmitters. It goes on to say, the association of serotogenic system with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So basically what they go on in the article to say uh, at the second row, the second paragraph, it says there are some high content sources of serotonin, melatonin, and tryptophan which can provide the body with these substances. These include plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, and tomatoes for serotonin. So what does it say? Notice that these foods that have the brain chemicals that you need are things like plantain, pineapples, kiwi. Do you notice these are foods that people naturally enjoy? Yes or no? Notice it's not like, oh, you want to be happier? You have to eat this bitter root that nobody likes. It's actually just the contrary that actually the foods that you naturally are designed to enjoy actually make you happier. They actually have chemicals in them that are made to make your brain healthier and happier. Isn't God great? So does this fit with the Genesis 1 account? Yes or no? Yes, that the food God gave in Adam and Eve in the garden of pleasure is the food best designed to bring pleasure to your body and your brain. So is there happiness in fruit? Actually, it's not just fruits and vegetables. Yes, it is there, but it is also in veggies. Yes, so fruits and veggies. So this is a, this is a, a study from the British Journal of Health Psychology. The title of it is, Many Apples a Day Keep the Blues Away. Daily Experiences of Negative and Positive Affect and Food Consumption in Young Adults. So the title is, Many Apples a Day Keep the Blues Away. What does that mean? Are they saying that you have to eat a bunch of fruit, a bunch of apples specifically every day? No, they're making a play on the, the phrase, an apple a day keeps the, the doctor away, right? And what they found is that actually, this is one particular study, this was in the British Journal of Health Psychology, but they replicated it here in the, in the uh, American Journal of Public Health. If you eat zero servings of fruit a day, you're statistically the least happy you're going to be. But if you eat one Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight servings of fruits or vegetables, you will actually statistically be happier as a result. Isn't that powerful? So you don't have to go find some food that you don't like to eat. Uh, how many of you know at least one fruit that you actually enjoy? Okay, that's most of us. Now, I've got to say, if you, like, for instance, drink some Mountain Dew and then bite into an apple, how does the apple taste? Terrible. Let's be honest. If you have a bunch of refined junk food and then right after it you try fruit, it tastes terrible. I'll be honest with you. But if you avoid the refined junk food and you eat, uh, you know, nice honey crisp apple, how does it taste? It tastes wonderful, right? So getting rid of the refined junk food, even if it's vegan, it's still junk food, getting rid of that and sticking to the whole food, it will actually taste good, but it will statistically make you happier. It'll actually make you a happier person. So we're going to look at some actually intestinal permeability. Can you go jump past all the intestinal permeability thing? We're going to talk about that in the next message. We're going to look at intestinal permeability and its negative impact on your marriage. What is intestinal permeability? The researchers call intestinal permeability. Actually, that's the the term that the scientists use, intestinal permeability. But the common man calls intestinal permeability. Anybody know what it's called? Leaky gut. You got it. Leaky gut. And, uh, but the researchers call it increased intestinal permeability. We're going to see how increased intestinal permeability can negatively impact your mental health and negatively impact your marriage and it might even actually make you more likely to be uh, an addict an actual addict but we're going to look at that in the next in in the next program that we look into powerful information here so here we are looking at something called dyspepsia 
we don't use this term in the common, common vernacular very often today, but what is dyspepsia? It's, it's a dyspeptic is of or having indigestion or consequent irritability or depression. So let's read the quote here. It says, for a dyspeptic stomach, you may place upon your tables fruit of different kinds, but not too many at one meal. So you don't want to have 10 different kinds of fruit at a meal. A few different ones, a few different kinds at a meal is enough. You don't need 10. Actually, having way too many things at one meal can actually be hard on your digestion. So if you really struggle with digestion, having literally at each meal, uh, if you really struggle with digestion, two or three things at a meal is generally about the most you want to do. Other people can have more, a bit more than that. But for somebody who really struggles with digestion, a few things at one meal is actually the best. Uh, I, I typically say this. There's, there's these meals that certain people eat every once in a while. They call them potluck. And I call potluck the most dangerous meal of the week. You know why I call it that? Because when you're at home, do you have... 18 different things on your plate typically. No, but for those of us, now if you've got a stomach of steel, you'll throw 18 things on your plate and you'll walk away and you'll feel just as good as you did at any other meal of the week. But for those, those of us with, with tender stomachs, we put 12 different things on our plate and how do you feel? You, you dip into a food coma, right? <laughs> You, you just, like, you can hardly stay awake. Your stomach doesn't feel good. You just feel crummy for the rest of the day. And so it's not that you can't go to potluck, but if you have a sensitive stomach, you want to try to keep it down to just a few things in order for you to feel better for the rest of the day and to start the new week on a good, on a good setting. But notice what it says is not too many at one meal, but we're told this, it would be well for us to do less cooking and eat more fruit in its natural state. Let us eat freely. Notice freely means you don't have to hold back on these things. You can eat freely of what? Of fresh grapes, apples, peaches, orange, blackberries, and all other kinds of fruit which can be obtained. So should you be worried about eating too much fruit, yes or no? No, you can eat freely of fruit. That's one of the great... And isn't that a nice thing about this time of year? Because this time of year, what's fresh? You have the fresh southern peaches are in this time of year. Isn't that wonderful? You have the California peaches this time of year. You have the California cherries this time of year. You have grapes. You have all these different things that are fresh right now. And you don't have to say like, oh, I should hold back. They're going to make me fat. Do people get fat from fruit? Is that why America's struggling so much these last few years? People are just overdoing it on fruit. People just eating too many grapes in America these last few years. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And yet people are actually afraid of that. I'm going to actually show you some amazing information in our last presentation, actually tomorrow, both on how to be happier as we we actually prepare food for you tomorrow. Food is going to be made. You're going to enjoy the food, but it's also food designed to make you healthier. It's the food that's actually designed to help reverse heart disease and type 2 diabetes, but also to help fight depression. But I'll show you just some of the most powerful things you've ever seen on weight loss tomorrow morning, things you've never seen before. Very, very powerful. But I want to share with you a personal experience here. And this is, why do I share with you this information? I ended up having depression. And it happened because I was living in Iceland. And we were living there for a year. And we all ended up Uh, myself, my wife, another guy who worked with us there, we all got stomach trouble. And I lost 30 pounds. And, you know, if, if you're overweight, that could be a good thing. But I was not very big to begin with. And when you lose 30 pounds, I just became just gaunt. And we all did. Actually, actually, Fadia became gaunt and my friend Nathaniel, um, he was overweight before he began. And uh, what ended up happening was when he lost 30 pounds, he looked phenomenal when we were all done there. So... (laughs) It it worked well for him, but it didn't work well for Fadi and myself. But I also suffered with depression for the first time in my life. And it it was deep and it was dark. And I was eating a healthy diet. I was exercising every day. But the food just wasn't staying in. I mean, we just couldn't keep the food in us. And so it was rough. But I didn't connect the depression with my gut. I didn't even think about that. I just thought, well, maybe it's the bad weather in Iceland, you know, the darkness and so forth. Uh, 
didn't make a connection. So years went by and then moved back to the United States and I suffered either chronic depression or at least seasonal depression, at least for sure in the winter. So for about eight years, either chronic or seasonal. And then the last two years, I was down in, I think it was Tennessee, and I got bit by a tick and I told the doctor friend, and she said, let me get you some uh, antibiotics just to make sure you don't get Lyme disease. And so I took the antibiotics and then I went into full-blown chronic depression year round and didn't realize then about the research. The research has been done that for showing, showing that every time you take antibiotics, if you take one course, you know, they give you the bottle and say, take these till they're done. If you take one round of antibiotics, it increases your chances of of depression by about 25%. And for every two to five rounds you take, increase your chances of depression by about 50%. Now, recognizing that, let's just think it through with what we've just learned today. What do antibiotics kill? Bacteria. Do they only kill bad bacteria? They just randomly kill bacteria. And research has shown that that's what they do. They actually change the microbial makeup of your gut. And so if you knock down the diversity of the bacteria in your gut, what do you think you're going to be more prone to? Depression. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. And so this is what we see. So I I took the antibiotics that year, and then the next year got bit by a tick, took some more antibiotics, went through another year of depression, solid depression, chronic, and it was terrible. I just felt guilty all the time. I tried to make my life right with the Lord, tried to, you know, com- brother, I'm sorry for what I said about you. And I paid thousands of dollars to try to right the wrongs of my past and nothing would bring me any, any peace whatsoever. I was spending time in the Bible every single day, exercising every single day. And, but just, it wasn't, I think it kept me from going into worse depression because I was still traveling internationally, still making documentary films, still doing all this work but just terribly depressed. But I think my healthy lifestyle otherwise helped me to not be like bedridden like some people become. And so just continued to go forward, but it was terrible. And then I heard a quotation that was similar to this quote that we're going to read right now. And this is what I ended up doing, something along this, this quotation right here. And notice what it says. It says, in many cases of sickness... The very best remedy is for the patient to fast for a meal or two. Notice it doesn't say for a week or two. It's not even a day or two. It's just a meal or two. So in many cases of sickness, the very best remedy is for the patient to fast for a meal or two, that the overworked organs of digestion may have an opportunity to rest. A fruit diet for a few days has brought great relief, often brought great relief to brain workers. Many times a short period of entire abstinence from food, followed by simple, moderate eating, has led to recovery through nature's own recuperative effort. An abstemious or a simple diet for a month or two would would convince many sufferers that the path of self-denial is the path to what? The path to health. And so I saw a quotation very similar to this, and so I thought, well, interesting. So I went on a temporary fruit diet. I do not suggest that someone just sticks with fruit for the rest of their life. But I went on a temporary fruit diet. Mine was longer than it says here. How long did this one say to go? A few days. How long is a few days? You know, it's kind of ambiguous, isn't it? Is is a few an exact number, yes or no? Is a few two? Is a few three? Maybe. Could it be four? Maybe. I mean, if you had, let's say you had five, you know, of of something in your hand, could you say, I have a few of these in my hand? But do you see, it's, it's not cut in, it's not set in stone. It's not a, a law exactly this long. So it's kind of, you know, maybe up to the individual. And so I did something, I'm kind of a fanatic, I guess. And so I didn't just do it, you know, for a few days. I didn't know this quote. I read another quote. And so I went for two full weeks just eating fruit. And I don't suggest that most people do that, actually, but I did it. And at the end of those two weeks, and this was, I started mid-December, and right around January 1st, for the first time in two years, I could choose where I focused my thoughts. 
instead of having constant depressive thoughts, and, and so much so that even I would make something right, I would go apologize to somebody, and then it would come back later, and it would come back as if I was guilty again, and I would forget that I had already apologized, and I go to them, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, and they're like, oh, you already apologized for that. So it wasn't that I was just suffering under conviction. It was a mental and it ended up being a gut issue. And so when my gut began to heal, for the first time in two years, I could choose where I focused my thoughts. I began to be happier. And I didn't say anything to my wife at first. I mean, she knew I had been depressed. But if you had told me, I tried all kinds of different things. People suggested, oh, take this supplement or this supplement. And so I tried each one, found no benefit. One time I thought for a few days I felt the benefit on something. But I obviously wasn't very prone to having, you know, typically people take something and they just believe it works and so it works. You know, the placebo effect, almost nothing made any difference to me. So I wasn't very prone to placebo effect. And one time I thought it worked for like three days, one thing, you know, and, and uh, then it went away and I was like, well, I guess that didn't work. But nevertheless, nothing worked. But I did this and, and it just began to change. It began to literally change my mind. And I was feeling so incredibly good that I ended up sticking with it. And then obviously I started backing, adding back to my diet nuts and grains and veggies and all these things. And eating a diversity of these things is the general best path, best path to health. And so, but I want to review this quotation here. We're going to look at this here, that some ways to balance the gut, number one, is to fast, not all the time, just if you're going to start this, you'd fast for a meal or two. That means literally skip one or two meals. If you only eat two meals a day, that would be fasting for a day or 24 hours or whatever. But otherwise, if you eat three meals a day, it'd just be skipping, you know, two of the meals. And that gives your organs of digestion opportunity to rest. Because if they're inflamed... You know, if you had an inflamed, like, uh, cut on your arm and you scratched it all the time, would it heal very easily? No. And if you have inflammation within your gut and you never give it a break, is it going to be easy for the inflammation to go down? No. So a short period of abstinence from food is very beneficial. Number two is to eat more whole fruits. Now, I know, I know friends in the, in the keto club and, and uh, paleo club will say, oh, fruit's bad for you. It actually raises your blood sugar. It'll give you diabetes. Uh, not true. <laughs> uh, here's a massive study of 100,000 people from the British Medical Journal. Massive study from a reputable journal looking at fruit and it's at being a causative factor in type 2 diabetes. It is true that for about 50% of people, melons like cantaloupe can increase their chances of diabetes. But the other 50% of people, it doesn't. But then you go on to strawberries, and almost, for most people, it lowers their chance. And once you hit oranges, it simply just lowers your chances of diabetes. Then you get on to peaches, plums, apricots. They lower it more. Grapefruit, more. Bananas, more. Apples and pears, more. And prunes. By the way, what's a prune? It's a dried plum now where were plums on our chart they're like four or five things back a dried plum which is a prune is more beneficial to a diabetic than even a fresh plum isn't that amazing it is incredible by the way a little side note do you know what we were told in those old books that you can eat more dried fruit than is customary with best results to health and what does the research show Exactly what we were told, right? So going even further, grapes and what? Ray, what's, what's a raisin? A dry grape. And notice for diabetics, raisins are just as good as a fresh grape. Incredible. Then you go on to blueberries and they lower your chances of type 2 diabetes even more. So the idea that fruit causes diabetes and they say, oh, but they're hybridized. Did you know that every single plant probably on planet Earth is hybridized? It's a natural process that happens all the time. When two plants cross-pollinate and they're just slightly different genetics, they're hybrids. Do you know your children are hybrids? They're part mom, part dad. Did you know every apple that's ever existed is a hybrid? Because apples only come to be when one apple pollinates, one flower pollinates, one flower on another tree, and whatever seed drops out of that comes out, and it's a hybrid. That's just, that's just how plants work. Hybrids are not evil in and of themselves. Um, but I could go on and on about that. We have a whole channel on health and homestead talking about these kind of things. But nevertheless, so let's get back to our research here. So uh, fasting 
eat more whole fruits. Number three is eat more whole grains. That could be whole wheat bread, oatmeal, and other well-cooked grains, unless you are a, you have celiac disease, which is 1% of the population, or about 5% of people have either some kind of wheat intolerance or gluten sensitivity. If you are a part of that 6% of people, you would be better to avoid them. But 94% of people do perfectly fine with gluten. This information comes from the top scientist on gluten, Alessio Fasano, and he specifically talks about these statistics. And so the vast majority of people actually do just fine with gluten. Uh, it's just a very small percentage of people that struggle with it. And once again, they'll say, well, it's hybridized. Everything's hybridized. That's every plant on earth is hybridized. So that's, that's just not a great argument. But nevertheless, so let's go on to the next one. Eat more whole vegetables. And so, uh, but once again, if you're part of that 6% who can't eat wheat or gluten, avoid it. You actually should avoid it. There is a percentage of society that will do better without it. Uh, but just because I'm allergic to something, that doesn't mean everybody else should avoid something that I'm allergic to. You follow? Like I told you last night, my poor wife can't eat what? Mangoes. mangoes. So you can never eat mangoes again. Would that make any sense? No. And if 6% of people have some kind of intolerance to gluten, that doesn't, that doesn't necessitate everybody else get off of it, right? Um, by the way, actually, they did a study with overweight people forcing them to eat 12 pieces of bread a day. 12 pieces. They could eat whatever else they wanted, but they had to eat 12, 12 servings of bread a day. And guess what happened? They lost weight. They lost weight. What happens is when people go gluten-free, what do they have to get out of their diet? Well, not just fiber, but if people go gluten-free, they're getting rid of junk food. Yes or no? Think about it. You can't eat cookies. You can't eat cake. You can't eat junk food at the store. So you can only eat food. Now, now there is gluten-free junk food. They do create ju gluten-free junk food now. But historically, you didn't even have that option. And so you were basically just eating healthy food and avoiding mainly junk food. You understand what I'm saying? And so, yes, you'll lose weight by doing that. If you can never eat cookies again, you can never eat cake again. Yes, I know there's gluten-free versions of these today, but you get my point. Uh, it's not actually, if you just eat bread with whole wheat bread with nothing on it, whole wheat bread is not a weight gaining food. Research actually shows it. Put, if you want to test it out, prove me wrong. If you're overweight, go eat 12 pieces of whole wheat bread a day and see if you gain or lose weight. I can guarantee you'll be losing weight if you're overweight. What's that? Yeah, no, no, no butter on it, no cheese, nothing like that. Try it. See what happens. And uh, actually, in the study, they might have even added those things. But the point is, I'm not saying you should. You shouldn't. Uh, but what do people, people eat, for instance, bread with cheese on it and bacon, and then they get overweight and they say, man, that bread made me fat. <laughs> do you see something wrong here? They eat, they eat, you know, I mean, whatever it is, they put bologna on there and they put cottage cheese and they put all this and they say, man, that bread just keeps getting me down, you know? And uh, is it the bread or is it the uh, stuff you put on it? But let's go forward. Okay. So eat more whole vegetables. That's a diversity of whole vegetables. Avoid spicy food. I'm going to show you some research on that. If you struggle with anger, depression, anxiety, lust, I'll share with you some research in the next presentation. The next one is... Eat a handful of nuts a day. And if you struggle with weight, no more than a handful of nuts a day. No more than a handful of nuts a day if you struggle with weight issues. And so next slide is that if you, if you, some people will find that when they give up meat and animal foods, within a week or two, they'll lose their energy. But if they stick it out a couple more weeks, you know what they'll find? Just like I did, I had more energy than I ever had in my entire life. You'll first have a dip because meat is very stimulating. But after getting away from it a while, you'll actually have more energy if it's a whole food plant-based. If you're eating refined junk food all the time, all you eat is Oreos and junk food and white bread, no, it's going to be terrible. But yes, if you're eating a diversity of plant foods, whole plant foods, you will have amazing results. So what did we see so far? We're going to close with something on this message before we get ready for our next message. That eating a diversity of plant foods, for every one serving a day of fruits and vegetables you eat, what happens to your mental health? You become happier, right? So if you, only, if you ate zero fruits or vegetables yesterday and you eat one today, you're going to be just a tiny bit happier. 
But if you eat two servings, you're going to be even happier. And if it continues to go up till you eat eight servings, and I'm guessing they only found people that eat eight, eight, eight servings a day. So could you get even happier with more than eight servings? I think you can. Uh, my wife and I, we eat a whole food plant-based diet and it's literally gotten rid of my depression. It got rid of my, my, almost all of my joint pain, unless I run too much. And it got rid of my migraine headaches going on a whole food plant-based diet. It got rid of my depression, There's it, it, my asthma, my allergies. It's over the top on how many things it actually ended up benefiting. And by the way, if you find some food, like let's say you're eating your diet of plant foods and you find out that you're allergic to broccoli. I've never heard of it, somebody being allergic to broccoli, but let's just say every time you eat broccoli, you get a stomach ache. Well, just take it out of your diet. There's other things you can eat. If there's one plant food you have to avoid, just avoid it. It's not that big of a deal. There's other things to eat. But I want to close with this. This is one of the most powerful things I've ever heard in my life. I'm not exaggerating. This is from the Victor Valley Medium Community Correctional Facility in Adelanto, California. This is the longest name they could have possibly thought of for a prison. (laughs) And... This was started by a Seventh-day Adventist multimillionaire businessman. He was given a... There's one thing you'll hear in popular society today, and I'm not trying to be political, but there's this big movement of like uh, private prisons are the most evil thing. Satan himself created them, people will say. No, I'm exaggerating. That's a bit of hyperbole. They think uh, private prisons are terrible. I think actually they're the best thing that's ever happened to... One of the best things that ever happened to crime in America. And this is why, but sadly... The government shut them down. But I'll I'll share with you, not about all private prisons. They shut this one down. This prison was started by a multimillionaire, Seventh-day Adventist businessman. And he wanted to make a genuine correctional facility that changed people's lives. Most prisons actually help people to become better criminals. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. But he wanted to start a true correctional facility that its name was not a misnomer, right? Right? What ended up happening? Well, this was, he was given in the state of California a 500 inmate prison. He was given the the contract to do that with the CDC, not the one you're typically hearing about in the news. This is the California Department of Corrections. And they split it up into two sides. One side would go on a total plant-based diet. The other side would be on a meat-based diet. But since he was Adventist, they couldn't put him on pork and stuff, so it became a clean-based diet clean meat side. And, but they gave the prisoners the choice. Do you want to go on the vegan side or do you want to go on the meat-based side? And now they got to choose between a new start program of vegan diet, occupational training, Bible studies, and anger management classes. And one of the government workers said, no way, no way. These guys would rather burn the place to the ground than go vegan. And so they gave them the choice. Just take a wild guess. What percentage of these criminals chose of their own volition to go vegan? Take a guess. Someone said 30? 70 percent. That's a pretty good guess. It was actually 85 percent of them chose to go vegan. 85 percent of them chose to go vegan. Now, you might be saying, why would a bunch of criminals, why would 85 percent of them choose to go vegan? I think it's because in part, you know what? They're tough, (laughs) and they don't care what people think about them. Whereas everybody else is like, (laughs) I'm a vegan. (laughs) You know, they're embarrassed. But the criminals are like, yeah, I'm a vegan. Yeah. Right? (laughs) And and so they don't care. Like, what you going to do about it, huh? I don't eat meat, right? Or whatever, you know? And so they chose to go vegan, 85% of them. Now, what happened in this prison? There's something in statistics within government research called recidivism. <clears throat> recidivism is a statistical measure at basically, okay, if you commit a crime, you go into the system, your name is taken down, and then they watch and you stay in the system to see if you commit another crime. And if you commit another crime, that's the rate of, if there's 10 people that go into prison and they all get out and five of them commit a crime again, there's a 50% recidivism. Does that make sense? 
And at this time, when this prison was running in the state of California, the recidivism rate was 95%. That means when you commit a crime, when you got out, 95% of the time you would commit another crime and go back to prison. Isn't that crazy? While Terry Moreland was running this prison, this vegan, plant-based, healthy living prison, the recidivism rate dropped in this prison from 95% all the way down to 2%. 95% down to 2%. Well, so you're thinking, this is incredible. The state of California, the other prisons began to get excited and began to think about adopting this. Because imagine if we could have 90 plus percent of people, when they go to prison once, they're truly reformed and never go back. Do you realize we could shut down more than 90% of the prisons in the United States of America? We right now are the most incarcerated nation in the world. We could become the least incarcerated if we would have stuck to this. So you know what they did? They shut down this prison. They shut it down. I was told, I actually interviewed one of the men who started it, Richard Bland. He was one of the individuals that started this prison. And uh, basically, you know, I, you may know that prisons are big what? Big money, big business. And in big business, one of the mo- in any business for that matter, one of the most important things is to have repeat customers. And so... If, imagine if a prison came along and it reformed everybody, what would you be doing to this business model? You destroy it. But interestingly enough, you would think a government, because remember the idea is that private prisons are evil, yet this private prison was the most successful private prison, it was the most successful prison, whether private or public, that this country has ever seen. You follow? And yet they shut it down. Now, if they shut it down and turned all the public prisons into this, I would say, oh, wonderful. Okay, that's fine. I don't care. As long as lives are being changed, but that's not what happened. What happened is they keep them going the same way they always had them and get rid of the one that actually worked. Isn't that sad? It literally is like heartbreaking because these guys, you can actually watch videos on YouTube of this prison. And you you can actually watch the interviews of these guys who are in there. And a lot of these guys had rough backgrounds. And these guys, they are changed while they're in there. And their family is being changed on the outside because of what's happened to them on the inside. Totally turning around these people's lives. Now, someone might be thinking, now, if God knew that changing people's diet could help them overcome crime, why didn't he just tell us about it? Guess what? He did. Check this out. This is taken from a book called Ministry of Healing, page 146. Wrong habits of eating and the use of unhealthful food are in no small degree for no small degree responsible for the intemperance and what? Crime and wretchedness that curse the world. We were told that people's intemperance in their diet was one of the major causative factors in crime. And guess what happens when you put it into practice and try it out in a prison? That's exactly what happens. Because most criminals grow up eating very poor diets. Because we actually fund a junk food craze for people who are low income. We actually fund junk food instead of funding healthy food for them. You see? What would happen if they changed their diets? There's actually a book called Diet, Crime, and Delinquency. You can actually see the information on this on our own government's website about this book, Diet, Crime, and Delinquency, and how they noticed that certain food made people more prone to be criminal. Fascinating. And so diet can actually change their life. Now, why would these people never go back to prison? Because, number one, they're happier people. Remember, God gave us this message of health to make us what? Happy. And if you're happy all the time, are you going to be as likely to rob people and kill and steal and beat people up? No. You may have heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. You understand what I'm saying? If you're hurt, you're more prone to do what? Hurt somebody else. But healed people heal people. Does that make sense? Hurt people hurt people. And the people in this prison they were healed. 
And so they became a healing force to the world around them. And friends, we can be the same way. If you struggled with anger, depression, anxiety, lust issues, changing your diet can make a big impact. Now, what we just saw here is going on a total plant-based diet can actually make you statistically happier. Just that change alone. But there's more things to do, and we're going to look at that more in the next message as we look at foods that could actually make you more prone to addiction, anger problems, lust. We're going to look at some specific things in that one as we go forward. And there's other lifestyle habits that you can actually implement to reverse depression. But I want to challenge you. I don't expect that if you're someone who, you know, like me, you grew up eating, you know, your favorite food was pork and, you know, you ate just whatever. I don't expect that you're going to go on a plant-based diet tomorrow. That's probably outlandish to even imagine. But I would challenge you if you ate no fruits or vegetables today, that tomorrow try eating one or two. And then in a week, you know, each day eat, add one or two. And then in a few weeks, maybe you'll have three a day and four a day and five. And finally, you'll get to eight a day like this research showed. And you'll be significantly happier and healthier as a result. So you don't even have to just get rid of things immediately. Just adding the good to the diet will start making a major impact. And sure, if you got to a totality, you know, changing your diet that way, you'd be even better off. But I would just try making positive progressive changes and you can become a happier person. But let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for science and scripture. Thank you that you were the first thing in the history that I've been able to find talking about the gut-brain connection. And we saw in the medical literature that actually Daniel chapter 1, this study on the gut-brain connection, is the first scientific study in all of recorded history. And Father, I thank you that you changed my life through this information. I thank you that I went through 10 years of depression because my life is so much better on the other side of it. I know I never would have been willing to change my diet like this. But it's been such a good experience for me. And it's been such a blessing to see other people's lives changed as a result of this also. So Father, I pray that each person would make any progressive positive changes that would be necessary in their life. If they ate no fruits or vegetables yesterday, they'd eat one today. And maybe two next week and three and continue to add until they find the great benefits to the food that you designed for our best health and happiness. Thank you for this prison that changed people's lives. Lord, I pray that somehow another one will start up and do this very same thing and that lives will also be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to be coming back in 45 minutes. It'll be 4 o'clock. We're going to go into our next session, which is, let me tell you real quick, it is uh, overcoming and uh, the gut-brain connection, overcoming bad habits like addictions and anger and lust. Oh. Can we have a question and answer session sometimes? We can. We absolutely can. We can do it after the next one. Have a question. Or now, or whatever. That would you like to have a Q and A? Okay, so we can have it um, after a, a break or after the next presentation. At the end of the next presentation, we'll have a Q and A presentation. So, begin to think about uh, questions. You